Okay, welcome to getting your gradebook ready to go for the school year. So this is kind of going to be a show and tell for those of you that don't have your schedules. Um, and for those of you that you do, if you want to follow along, feel free to, or you can just watch. So I'm going to share my screen so you guys can see what is going on. So hopefully you are seeing my gradebook screen. Um, this is a demo database. So there are regular high school classes in here, as well as some elementary that are standards based. So I will go through all of it uh, with you guys, including the standards based section for those of you that are um, using the standards. So we're kind of going to navigate through some of these things and starting with some simple things that you might know already, um, but just making sure that um, you're set up and ready to go. So how do classes come over? So when you get your classes, you can see here I have, you know, four different um, classes. They come through alphabetically. So, you know, they don't come through in your periods, they come through alphabetically, then by sections. So numerically, then by sections. So you can see 49 comes before 50. So how do I get these things changed? So I have my edit list. So some of you guys are already doing this. You're giving your classes names, such as first period, period one, whatever it might be, which is great. Some of you also have semester classes. So you might teach, you know, if you're teaching a specials class that's only a semester long, or maybe your district puts your um, your classes in semester. So first semester math, second semester math, whatever it might be. I'm going to give you a tip. And my tip is any of the settings that we talk about today, work on the settings first, then hide your classes because you don't want to change some of the settings and forget a class if it is hidden. So get all your settings, everything set up properly, then come through and hide classes. So you can see here, I have administration class that's hidden. A lot of times this is for our elementaries. That's how they take attendance, give comments, things like that, promotion um, and so forth. And then you can see this one's also hidden as well. So maybe this is my second semester class. Once I have all my settings, I can click on hide, save, and then it'll be hidden. Again, I would suggest um, setting all your preferences in your settings first before you come through and hide it. Next is giving your classes names. So again, your section number here does not necessarily mean that that is the period that you are teaching. Um, so Again, this is a demo database, so my section numbers are really high. Sometimes, depending um, your districts, when they are scheduling or making classes, maybe section 35 is always, you know, for the virtual kids, maybe section 45 is for um, the inclusion kids, whatever it might be. So you might see some, some trends with the section numbers and you might see one, three, five, seven, nine, and you're like, oh, those are my periods. That's not bad. No, make sure you find out what period it is before you automatically assume that it's first period or third period. So I don't know if you knew, knew this. Um, I learned this this summer. If you hover over your classes, it is going to show you your class roster while you are in the screen. So if you're looking through and you're like, oh, which one was the first semester, which one was the second semester, or you're like, oh, I know so-and-so is in first period, so, oh, this is my first period class. So I can give it a name. And then this is what I really wanna talk about is the order. So again, by default, it comes through alphabetically. If you don't give it in order, it will stay alphabetically by the class name, okay? Not by the alias, by the class name. So if I wanna put my periods in order, so then maybe this is period two. So this is period two. I wanna start ordering these. So be aware, blanks come before numbers. So if I wanna number this and I'm like, okay, I want this at the top of my list and I want this one at the bottom of my list. 
and I hit save. Notice it puts them both together because again, it will organize them alphabetically with any order that is blank and then it'll start ordering based on the numbers. So any that you want at the bottom, just give it a high number and it'll place it there at the bottom. And I'm gonna remove these so they're not all the way at the bottom. Okay, so again, blanks first and then numbers. So that's how you can get things arranged. I'm gonna come back to my grade book. In here, you can see I have my classes renamed. Each of my class periods, be careful when you're working with this, um, as especially at the beginning of the year, as schedules are being changed and so forth. When I am looking at my classes, you might see students that have been withdrawn with a red um, W next to their name. And I'm sorry, the demo database takes forever to get into things. So as I'm talking, it'll populate. Um, but this is my gradebook screen. If I go into my actual dashboard of this and I'm like, oh, you know what, Garrett withdrew from my class. So he would have a red W next to his name. Very, very common. So if I go to update roster, Inside of update roster, this is where I can hide my students. So whoever I need to hide. So if I'm gonna hide Garrett, click on hide and then hit save. Same here as you saw with your class list, you can put your students in order, but your students come in order by last name. Okay, so that's typically how you want them to um, come through. So once I hit save, it's now saved. I can go back into my dashboard and you'll see that Garrett is now missing from my roster. Okay. Um, I just point that out because I see a lot of people that um, still have those students listed here, especially at the elementary level. And then when you're entering report cards, those kids still show up on that report card screen. So if you're done um, trying to calculate their grades and put a grade on their report card, hide them from your class. So they don't need to be in your class list anymore. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to my gradebook screen. So we're gonna kind of talk this side here. So most of this stuff that I'm gonna talk about in my average calc setup and my administration is also listed on the dashboard of each class, most of it. Okay, so we're going to kind of start talking here with the first thing, which is my teacher preferences. So my teacher preferences is only here on my front screen. So I'm going to click on that. And this is kind of the default settings for you. So how do you want this set up when um, you are creating your class? So looking at my teacher preferences, Typically, add this assignment to the assignment bank is checked by default, um, and that's fine. Basically, what that does is any assignments that you create, it puts it in the assignment bank so you can use it year after year, and I'll show you how to import those assignments back in. The one that you typically should check and save is postmarks to the web. So if I check postmarks to the web, every assignment that I create is going to get posted to parent access for parents and students to see. By default, this is off. Um, so then when you create each individual assignment, you would have to check it um, for each of those assignments. So once I hit save, this is saved for my first period class. So then what I can do is once I have everything saved here, then I can copy it to all my other classes. This is why I suggest don't hide first, get all your settings set, um, and then you can go back in and hide because you want to make sure these are set. You might not remember it midway through the year at the semester break um, to, hey, I forgot where to go to postmarks to the web. Okay, so once you're done, make sure you hit copy and then you can go back to the home page. So you can click any, any time where it says grade book, um, you can click on that and that takes you back to the home screen. Okay. Oh, 
I need to go back there. I forgot to show you something. Show comments autocomplete. So this is a newer feature. It came out, oh, maybe around spring break-ish time. Um, and I did post some stuff on the login page for the progress book um, login page. So what the show comments does is it allows you to create an basically a comment bank. So if you're giving comments for an assignment, it allows you to create a bank of things that you use over and over again, such as have a great summer or has shown great improvement or great work. Um, so those you can have in a bank and you start typing one or two characters, it will populate and you can just autofill it. Um, so kind of a nice feature. I know some people copied and pasted before and things like that, um, but now this is where you can actually create your own bank and have those auto populate. So you might want that on um, for all of your classes as well. Okay. So let me show you that real quick and then we will actually look at um, creating assignments and and so forth a little bit later. But wh what the assignment bank, or I'm sorry, the comment bank is, when I am working in any of my assignments, and we'll talk about assignments, um, the assignment bank allows you to have banks. So if I click here and I start typing with an L, you can see it automatically populates that bank item for me. If I click where it says assignment comment bank, these are any of my banks that I have created. So you can add more. So for example, keep up the good work. You're like, you know what? I do use that quite a bit. Once you get done typing this little bank symbol, I don't know why they put it as a bank. Um, well, I know it's a comment bank, but usually comments have the little paper and pencil. But anyways, this will add it to the bank. So if I click on that, you'll see that it says comment bank has been, comment has been added to the bank. Now when I click on it, you can see I have both of them in here. So if I start typing, and as soon as I hit a K, you can see it auto populates it. It is not case sensitive. I repeat, it is not case sensitive. So if you look, when I hit enter, it kept the lowercase k, okay? If I try to click on, if I click on the bank again, it will say that this already exists even though it is typed in lowercase, okay? So just be aware of that. You can see the differences between the two of them. Okay, it will not allow you to add the same comments, okay, um, but you can have different wording. So if I want to say, um, once I have that in there, you'll see that the bank appears. So now I have very similar comments. Okay, okay I'm going to go back to my Gradebook home screen. So before we finish talking about some of the administrative things, let's look at our average calc setup. So this has to be done at the beginning of every year. Um, so our calc setup, the first thing that you have to do as soon as you get your classes in gradebook is set up your assignment types. Once you have your classes and can set up your assignment types, you can see here, um, this is set for all of my classes or I can do them one at a time. So if I want to come through here, I can just do one at a time. This is for my first period class. Okay. So when I'm looking at this, oops, I want to go to all my classes. Okay. You do not want to have mixed mark types. Okay. And you can see here some of mine are grayed out, but I have elementary in this demo as well as high school. But you will see that for my American literature, they are all points. So points points, points, and points. Why are these grayed out? Well, that's because I have assignments that are linked to them. So it will not allow you to delete them or change them if you have already created assignments for them. So if you need something new, you can add new ones and select the classes that you want them to go to. Um, remember when you're creating an abbreviation, 
make sure you're typing in, especially for assessments and assignments, because it will shorten the abbreviation. So just making you aware because this does show in the dashboard for on your teacher screen. Um, so make sure you're creating the abbreviation that you want, because those abbreviations is that's what you're going to see as assignments are created. So you'll see right here, this is all of those abbreviations. Okay. So once you have those set, and again, they will carry over from last year, you just have to make sure you're checking it per class that you're going to use it with. If it is for all classes, you can hit the check mark and it'll go across all classes. <clears throat> but again, in this case, I have elementary, so they are using a one, uh, one through four scale where my other classes are using a point system. Once you have your assignment types created, you can then set up any of your class weights. So some districts require you to have specific weighted um, assignment types. Um, some of you do not. Some of you just use straight averages and that's fine. This is based on your assignment types. This is not per assignment. So you also have the option to weight an individual assignment when you're creating that assignment um, in your gradebook. So by default, it will be set to straight average. If I want to change this, um, you know, so if homework is worth 25, tests are worth 25, Classwork is worth 25 and quizzes is worth 25, which, okay, let's not do that because that's a straight average. Let's do 10 and 35. And this will be five. If you leave any blank, that assignment type will not be calculated. So notice I had to include something in extra credit. I never suggest using extra credit as an assignment type. Extra credit should be added on in a specific assignment type category. So if you're giving a homework assignment, um, you know, it's worth 10 points, give them bonus points with that homework assignment and so forth, instead of weighting it five points, because now all of these are out of 95 points instead of 100 or 95% versus 100. Once you set that up, you can copy it to all of your other classes. Again, this is done individually. So again, another reason why don't hide until you're done setting all these things up. I'm not going to save that. I'm going to leave it as a straight average. Okay, And it will automatically recalculate your gradebook when you hit save. So if you added an assignment and you're like, oops, I forgot to set up my assignment types, you can come in here and change it. Okay. And don't forget to change it to weighted average. Okay. Once I, you can see it blanks it out. So change it to weighted average, add those weights in there, and then save and then copy. Any questions with weighting your assignment type categories? Because I know that's kind of the tricky one versus creating an assignment and weighting the assignment. So you're going to say, oh, this homework assignment, this maybe it was a big project and you're going to weight it twice. So instead of it being worth 20 points, it's worth 40 points. Okay, so let's go on. Um, a few of you, this might not apply to anybody on this. I know a few of you are standards-based uh, grid I typically turn those on at the beginning of the school year. Um, some of our specials teachers, um, they use the grid for easier grading um, so that they can fill down a little bit easier. So if by some chance you don't see the standards-based grid um, showing, first contact me and we'll make sure, you know, if I turned it on for the district, or you might have to come in here to change your grading scales. Typically, this is always set to default. You don't need to change this. Once in a while, we need to change this to custom setup one, which might be for our CCP classes or students that are taking a class um, pass fail. And then any of my elementary that are using standards-based um, grading, 
it would be set to custom setup too. Okay. So again, typically you don't change that. Typically we do, but it is an option, um, especially for my high school teachers, um, if you have to change that for any of your CCP classes. Okay, let's go back to your gradebook. And like I said, as we're talking about these, these things are listed right here as well. So they're also available on the dashboard of each class um, versus just being on the gradebook screen. But you'll notice you don't see like the teacher preferences and a few of those things. Those are only on, on the administration part of your gradebook home screen. Which we're going to dive into a few more of these. Um, so we already looked at our preferences. That's the first thing you really want to set up. You've got to get your assignment type set. And then if your district requires any um, calculation uh, methods and weights. Setting up gradebook access. This is important and a lot of elementary do this because you share kids. So, you know, maybe you have a group of kids for reading um, and, you know, Mrs. Smith has them for math. Well, you guys want to share each other's gradebook so you can um, work with those students. So, or maybe you have a Parapro in your classroom. So you want to give access to the Parapro so that they can see your class, um, the inclusion class that you're teaching. So they just have to have an account with Gradebook in order to for you to be able to share with them. So to click on this, it's going to say, okay, choose a class. So I'm going to click on my first period class and you can see I am the primary teacher. Yes, I know I'm not Linda Brown. I'm Shelly Baltic, but in this case for the demo, um, I am Linda Brown. I am the primary teacher. Typically, you should not have two primary teachers um, if you are co-teaching and it's an official co-teacher, um, they will be listed as well, but it has to be coded correctly in Dazzle for them to automatically come over. If you just have a, uh, a teacher, an uh, intervention specialist or a parapro that comes into your class periodically, but you want them to have access to gradebook, this is where I will add my teacher. So I'm gonna click on add teacher to my gradebook. I would pick I can pick by building or I can type in their name. So I'm going to add John Johnson to my class and I'm going to hit update. So now you can see that John Johnson has now been added as an additional teacher starting on today's date and then ending a year from now. But typically we, uh, turn off integration in July. So these get wiped out prior to the end date anyway. So don't worry. And you're like, oh, I don't want them to have access to it next year. You won't because everything gets wiped out over the summer. So that's not a big deal, but it typically goes for one calendar year. Okay. Um, so I am going to go back into my grade book here. And again, you can copy that over to any other classes. So if it's the same teacher, you can copy it into multiple classes and so forth. So that is setting up gradebook access. Now let's talk about these two. Setting up groups within a class versus grouping classes together. This one is not used as often, but it's grouping, setting up groups within classes. So maybe you have an A group and a B group. Um, maybe you're doing, maybe it's for science and it's for a lab. So the A group goes on Mondays and Wednesdays or Monday, Tuesday, and the B group goes on, you know, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, whatever it might be. So you wanna set up some groups. So, because when you're giving the assignments, you want to make sure that, you know, you're assigning it to that first group versus the second group, whatever it might be. So, when you pick your class, um, so I'm going to click on, okay. So, in my composition class, I'm going to set up group A and group B. Maybe they're reading two different stories and you want to give them different assignments. So, I'm going to add a group and what are we going to call this? We're going to, or maybe one's giving a persuasive writing and one is giving argumentative writings. So whatever it whatever it's going to be. So I'm going to do group A. I can put a description here um, and this is going to go to my composition class. So when I click on this, 
it so it will select the entire class okay so you're like mm, well that doesn't make sense yeah that doesn't make sense because group a would be my whole entire class so i don't want to just click on the class and bring it over i want to click on it and i want to say show students this will bring the students individually so now if i look at my student list and be careful because it does show all of your classes so it's just it's just a huge long list of kids. So maybe I wanna bring this kid over and you can double click or you can click on their name and hit the, the little side arrow. And I don't want this student. Let me go back to my composition. So I want Sandy and I'm gonna do Tiffany. Okay, so I'm gonna hit update. Here's my group A. So what's the point of that? So when I am creating an assignment, so I'm gonna create my assignment here. And then I'm gonna assign it to, okay, this was classwork. I let them work on it in class. When is it due and so forth. Now notice right here, it says assign this to a student group. By default, it goes to all kids, which it should. But in this case, group A is the only one working on this assignment that I spelled wrong. And so I'm just gonna assign this to group A. So once I do that, I'm gonna hit save. So it's saved. So what did it do? Well, when I go to my marks tab, it excludes it from everybody else except for those kids that are in that group, okay? And you'll see here that it's never been assigned to them. So it's different than sitting here and going, okay, exclude from you, exclude from you, or, or skipping over them. Um, so it's just a way that the, the students don't even see that assignment and parent access, the parents don't see it. It just hasn't actually been assigned to them. So that's a group within a class. And you can have multiple groups, so you have group A, group B, group C, and so forth. Also, when you're looking at that, and this was my composition class, when I go to my update roster, I can assign them here as well. I have to create the group first with at least one person in it, but then I can come here and I can add as needed. Okay, so that's an update roster. And I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but so when you edit your list and you give it your class aliases, it doesn't automatically alphabetize based on your class alias names. It still goes based on the official horse name. But when you go into any of your other, um, your dashboard or, or when you're doing your um, calculation uh, weights, anytime you see it, then it's alphabetical. I don't know why it does it. It drives me crazy, but I just wanted to point that out for you guys. Okay, so let's go back here. So we set up groups within a class. Then we have group classes together. Now, lately, this has kind of been tricky. So um, this does not work across buildings, okay? Because typically across buildings, um, you have different report cards. And what do I mean by cross buildings? We have a lot of eighth graders taking high school math and or I know like ag class sometimes is offered for a high school credit. So they're going over to the high school. So you can't group classes that have different report cards. So if that grade's gonna go on the middle school report card, um, you don't wanna group those classes together because then they're two different report cards and you're gonna be putting grades in the wrong spot. But in order to group a class, um, you can only group classes together that have similar assignment types. So I can't group a traditional class, so my American literature class with a standards-based class. It just does not work that way. But if I have period one and period two, maybe this is my um, gen ed kids and maybe this has some of my inclusion kids. So I might wanna call this first period. Oh, this is American Lit. So we'll do it that way. So it's gonna be all of those kids. So I'm gonna say update. 
it grouped them together. Now when I go into my gradebook, I'm going to see all of it. I'm going to see my original class for the two of them. And then I am automatically going to see at the bottom of my list, my grouped class. So once you group it together, you do or can, I should say, hide these. And then you'll see here it automatically says this is a group class and puts it at the bottom. Okay, so then I can hide those. And here is my American Lit class. So you'll see it right there. Okay, so I'm going to unhide those. And if you need to modify or change your group, I'm just going to click on it and I'm going to delete it. So you'll see I no longer have that grouped class together. If you try to group two classes together that are not compatible, it'll it'll give you a message at the bottom of that screen. Okay, one other thing that I want to talk about that happens a lot at the beginning of the year, um, students are are changing from first period to third period or, you know, whatever it might be. So I have a student going from first period into my second period or third, we'll say it's third period class. You can transfer the student marks. You have to wait until the student has been withdrawn from the one class and then you are going to transfer the student marks. So it's right here. So another tip is if you're going to transfer student marks, do not hide the student that has the red W. So you got to do the transfer first, then you can hide the student that has the red W. So for example, here, if um, I had Garrett, remember Garrett was on my list. So if I hid him, I would not be able to to transfer his marks. So I would unhide him and save. And then when I come back into my transfer marks, where is he going? Okay, so he's been transferred to, so he's been, tr he transferred to this class. Who is my student? Uh, bad example. But um, we'll just pick Wesley. And then he's going to what class? Okay, so he's going to section 57. I'm not going to transfer him because I can't log in as um, Eva. So, but it goes that way. Classes have to have at least one assignment in order to populate in this list. So if if your guidance counselor creates a new course for you, say, you know, you're like, oh, you know, I have all these kids. Can't we add another section? So it becomes ninth period. If you have not created an assignment for that class yet, it will not populate in your list to transfer it. So then you would go to your dashboard. You would create at least one assignment. Okay, so you can see. I would create an assignment here and then it would populate. Okay, so it's where they're going to, who the student is, and where they're coming from, and then what you want to transfer. Okay, so um, this would be based on quarter. I will tell you, and it works, seems to work better with dates versus picking quarter one, quarter two, quarter three. Um, it does work, but I, I've noticed I've had better success with the dates um, than I have with just picking the reporting period. Once you have it transferred, um, we'll do. Okay. Once you have it transferred, so I'm just going to pick quarter one, you can say check availability or com compatibility, and it'll say, okay can we do this or can't we do this? Okay, so these classes do not share assignments, so you cannot do that. Okay, um, so then what you can do is get the student's progress report or, you know, depending if it allows you to transfer into one assignment or for each assignment type. Okay, so if they don't share the same assignment types, so if they're going from algebra to geometry and the assignment types are different, it's not going to 
allow you to go into each assignment type. You would just have to transfer it as one assignment. Okay. Next, we forget about this one, um, but it is available for all of your classes individually, is to exclude the lowest mark. You would pick what grading period, what classes you want to, you know, that you're going to use this. So if it's all your math classes, you can check all your math classes. If it, um, at my elementary, you're not going to use your administration class, things like that. But by default, it does check all your classes from the start. And then what do you want to exclude? Are you excluding um, the lowest homework assignment or are you excluding the lowest um, classwork assignment. So we are going to pick, um, I'm going to uncheck this and I'm going to select my American Lit and I'm just going to say we're going to exclude the lowest homework assignment and then it's going to say okay. It's not do homework, let's do classwork. I know there's stuff in there. Let's see what it's categorized as classwork homework. Oh, okay, let's try this again. Sorry, I shouldn't. I'm just going to do that. And we're just going to do our classwork or homework and say next. So it is going to show you who the student is, what the assignment is called. And we know that that's all homework because that's what we picked. But you can do tests and quizzes if you have them as separate categories. And then what their mark was for this assignment. So this is what the student's grade was before removing it. And this is what the student's grade would be after. So because it's taking away some of the points um, and depending on how you wait and so forth, this would make the student's grade go, go down. So it does not exclude it. If it makes the student's grade go up, like in this case, it will exclude that assignment. Or I'm sorry, vice versa. Okay. So, um, so this is just a uh, check. So you can check. You can, you know, maybe you decided you're like, okay, I do want to exclude this kid, or and and you can uncheck it and say, hey, I'm just gonna let it go, and we're taking that assignment out of it, so it excludes those kids. So then, once I hit exclude marks, everything is gonna be. It's gonna show you which ones were excluded. So if I go back to my dashboard and look at Wesley, at his reading, you can see right here, it automatically comments for you. Exclude and it posts, posts it on parent access. And then it says why. Okay. So again, you're not gonna do that right at the beginning of the year. Um, you know, if maybe at the end of the quarter, say I'm going to get rid of the lowest quiz grade and so forth. Um, that is an option per class, per assignment type. Okay, let's go into an individual class. So I'm going to go into my first period, American Lit, and let's look at creating seating charts. So the seating chart has come a long way. Um, you, depending on how you want to use the seating chart, you can take attendance with the seating chart. You can just create it to, um, you know, to print out for your sub plans and so forth. So we're going to create a new one. If you had one created, it would be listed. For example, I have one here. Um, you know, they would just be listed in your seating chart. So you can have multiple seating charts for a class. So like I was talking about, maybe your science, you have a lab and you might want to have, you know, a Monday, Wednesday seating chart and a Tuesday, Thursday seating chart for a sub um, if the kids are at lab and not at lab. Okay, but we're going to create one. So very simple. Click where it says add a new chart, or you can click on the plus to add a new seating chart. So you're going to name it. Um, any comments that you want. Um, you know, maybe this is for attendance 
to. Pick your colors. So I'm going to pick this group. Maybe green's our school color. And then pay attention to these check boxes. Okay. So few things. Now it shows the preferred name. So what the preferred name is, is based in their student profile. In student information, there is a spot for name pronunciation and preferred name. So for example, Michael goes by Joey. How does he go by Joey? Well, maybe it's his middle name. Maybe it's a nickname his parents have given to him. And that's that's what they've always called him. So it's going to come up preferred name and it's going to show Joey. Um, do you want desk comments to show? So if you write any comments in your seating chart, do you want the student picture to show? Yes, please. Um, especially with, you know, high attendance rates and so forth. Show the students pictures. Um, when I met with all the administrators for um, gradebook setup, we made sure pictures were on for the district. So those are there, use them. They might still be last year's until you guys get the new pictures um, taken for the year, but at least you have a visual. And if you print them out for your sub, your sub has that as well. And then do you want daily attendance to show up? Do you wanna see if they're absent, not absent? Maybe you're only gonna use this for subs and printing it out for your sub plan. So you don't need to show the the daily attendance, um, but maybe you want to do it and allow attendance to be taken. So this is the important one. Period attendance for my middle school, high school. Um, remember, period attendance just stays within um, within gradebook where your daily attendance that gets submitted to student information. So once I have this created, I'm going to say safe, and then it says, "How do you want this set up?" Okay, so how is your room arranged? If your room is arranged in all kinds of different ways, you just have to pick somehow and then you can rearrange the desks individually. But I'm just gonna say by columns and then it says how many um, desks do you want across? So I have four columns of desks. And then how do you want them arranged? So if I want them A to Z, if I want them random, However, you know, I want them, I'm just going to pick. And it says that there are 15 students. So it's going to place those 15 students in four columns. Then maybe the teacher desk is here. So I'm going to move Igor over here and I want to add a teacher desk so I can add a desk. It's not going to be a student, but if I did get a new student join into my class, I can pick their name from here. If I just want a teacher desk, I just want one. I can pick a color. So, and then I'm gonna hit save. Don't ask me why, but the teacher desk always goes in the upper left corner and it over goes over whoever was sitting there. I just need to click and move it. And then you can see trace again. And the teacher desk actually can be resized um, and moved around. So if you need to put it in other places. The other nice thing is maybe uh, you want a warning for sub, you know, maybe a student has a severe allergy or maybe they leave and go to, um, you know, a, a intervention specialist throughout your class, something like that. So I'm going to flag my student so I can click on my student individually. Oops. Why? Oh, here. There we go. So once I click on my student, I can customize that student. So if I want to put, um, I feel like peanut allergy isn't as common as it used to be, um, but you know I can mark it as red and make it nice and and bright so the teacher or the uh, the sub can see it. If I print out, it's going to be a different shade of gray if you don't have a color printer. If I click on it, when I lock it, um, if I click on it, it's going to say the comment, click on it again, it'll shrink it and it gives you the little um, comment caption. Okay. So if I want to move desks around and so forth, um, I have to be I guess you would call this an edit mode, so I can move things around as needed. So if I need to switch a desk like that, um, once I lock it, 
you will see I can't do anything. It doesn't allow me to, but now the print button shows. So I can then print this from here. Also notice that I, I can have my display, which is just seeing comments and things, or I can turn on since I said allow daily attendance, I get a drop down and say, okay, Sloan is absent and Bruce is absent. Okay. And if I need to add another one, I can add another um, seating chart for this class. And we'll go back. If I went back in, then my seating chart would be listed under the drop down. Okay. And you'll notice here for daily attendance, it allows me to do daily attendance by my seating chart, which will take me directly into my daily attendance screen. Okay, few things um, when you're adding an assignment. So if we add an assignment, um, you know, the important one is the due date. This is how it populates in your gradebook and what um, quarter it should calculate it for. So the assigned date, it doesn't matter. Um, the assigned date, it's just, and a lot of times for my high school, when you are doing exams, especially seniors at the end of the year, sometimes they take their exams like May 10th, May 12th. Um, so you can put this as the date that they actually took it. And then you gave the exam to the rest of the students on May 20th. So that would be your due date. Um, or if you have a certain window that your guidance counselor gives you, um, based on when you have to enter your exam date, this could be the actual exam date, and this is the date, which is usually a Saturday or a Sunday, and that would be the dates that they tell you. Okay. So other ways that you can add assignments, so we know how to add one individually, but you can also import assignments. So I like this feature because it allows you to kind of see where you were in the, in the quarter with the assignments if you're using some of the similar assignments um, based on the date. So if I say import assignment, it's going to say, okay, well, we did the pretest on the second. So maybe that was the start of school. And then I want to be, you know, on the Romeo and Juliet within two weeks of the start of school. Oh, look, I was working on it August 13th. So you can see when you taught it last year um, and you know see if you're on track. But then if that's something that you wanna add back into this, so I wanna add this back in, I'm gonna click on the little drop down import arrow it brings it up and I can modify as needed. So maybe I'm like, you know what, last year this was you know, kind of tough and I'm gonna make it out of five points this year. So I can adjust as needed, okay. change due dates as needed and then hit save. And then there's my new assignment. The other option you have is to bring it over from um, Gradebook, or not Gradebook, Google Classroom. So I have this assignment. It has been turned in. So Wesley turned in the assignment. I'm going to give him a, we'll say, give him a four. So it saves it when we're working in Google Classroom. But if any of the turned in assignments are still in draft, which means you have not returned the grade to the student, it will not populate in Gradebook. Okay, so I want to give you this example real quick. So I'm not going to say add assignment. I'm going to go to Google Classroom Sync. Most of us have probably done this, especially during COVID. First time through, you will have to sign into your Google account. What category, your assignment type, do you want that to go in? So this was classwork. Select your class. And these class names do not have to match the names that are in gradebook. Okay. And then this is um, the assignment. You can see one was turned in. And I'm going to click on next, but you'll see that next to there, there's no grade. That's because I have not returned it. So if it is in draft, even though I've given it a grade, I still have to click on the return. So once I hit return, you'll see now that it says it's been graded. 
So if I run through this again, okay, you can see now it switched from turn to integrated. So now when I go through this process, it's going to give me a four. And then I'm going to hit sync and it's going to come across. So several different ways that you can add your assignments, adding it traditionally, importing it from last year, or bringing it over from Google Classroom. Um, do I have any Ashland? Because I was going to say Ashland, you guys bring it over from Canvas. Okay. Next are comments. Um, use these comments. This is not just for you. It's for parents. I this is how I get on my kids. If I see comments from the teacher, um, you know, I'm in parent access, you know, that's when I talk to my kids. If I just see an assignment, I'm like, okay, well, they did fine on it and, and no big deal. So there's two different types of comments that I want to talk about. The first would be your daily comment. So that is listed right here. So I can write something about Joya. Um, Make sure you say post it to the web. You can put daily comments for yourself and not post them to the web. Um, you know, if every Monday they forget their instrument for band or something like that, and you just want to kind of track to see how many times you can use the daily comment for that without posting it to the web. And then the second one is um, your assignment comments. So let me refresh my page real quick you will see that the pencil will have, um, you can see it looks like it's um, has writing in it. And then if I hover over it, it's gonna tell me what the comment is. Um, so you can see that. The other one is within our assignment. So here is the one from Google Classroom. Oh, and I see the little Google Classroom icon is missing again. Awesome. They have a hard time with that staying there. So if I wanna say, um, So here's my comment for Wesley. So what does this look like for parent access? So when I go into my parent access, so every teacher has access to see parent access, it will default to your kids alphabetically. And I'm sorry if you can hear behind me, they are mowing and weed eating. Um, so here is Joya, my first student. And if I scroll down to the bottom, Oh, wait, where's my American lit? Here's today's comment for my American literature. Okay. Um, if I scroll, it should have any other comments that I've made. If I go into my home, you will see here's today's comments. So this is coming from American lit. If I go into American lit, you'll see now here are all my daily comments. So there's a list of them. Then you can see here are my assignment comments, okay? And then if I switch between students, so Wesley, I just put in that one for American Lit, and you can say great response today, okay? So when he has no daily comments, they're not listed. So that's the, that's the difference. Um, so one goes with the assignment and the other one is just a running record. And sometimes people want that running record, especially for our special ed kids to kind of uh, communicate with the parents so that they know what's going on. Um, so that all of a sudden they're, they're not shocked to say, okay, well, I didn't know that he wasn't behaving in class or, you know, the student's been extremely tired on Mondays. So whatever it is, um, the parents can see that. After the day is over, and if there are no comments, they would have to go into each of the um, courses in order to be able to see those. Okay, and last but not least, um, some of our districts are starting to go with so, uh, the discipline module that is built in. So I'm just gonna talk about that real quick. So if I want to submit a discipline referral, if your district is using this, it's under student and the bottom on your gradebook screen. Or if I am within my class, so I am on the class dashboard, 
I would have to go into my individual student. So if Trace here, I caught him um, running down the hall, I'm gonna click on my student. There is a discipline tab. I'm going to add a new discipline incident. Okay, so what building, it'll all depend on what access you have. Um, it's going to date and time stamp it. And then when did it happen? Where did it happen? So I want to say it was, you know, in front of, you know, room 234, whatever, all your rooms are going to be listed there. And then what was the infraction? So if I say, okay, well, they were, it was a disruption. Your building, your building principal might have you fill this out. You might just have to submit the offender and give the incident of what happened. Um, so it's all based on what your district has decided. And if two kids were fighting, so I have Wesley, and then if I needed to pick another student, so if it was Trace, I can add, and Trace is now part of this um, discipline uh, referral as well. And then I would hit submit, and both of those would have that referral. I'm going to stop there and see if there are any questions. Great question, Lori. Um, so if her question is, can daily comments be printed for one student? So you do have reports in here. Um, so your class progress is your like a mini grade book. Your class roster, we print those at the beginning of the year to have our class lists. Um, you do have the missing assignment report and I thought the daily comments were on one of Well, when you're entering information manually, what you want to do is add the few that have the different grades. So maybe this kid got a four, this kid got a four, and this kid got a two. Everybody else got threes. So then what I'm going to do is say three. I'm going to right click and say fill column. Notice it doesn't override those few that were different. This works for standards-based grading. This also works for traditional grading. So if you give a homework assignment and it's going to be worth 10 points, majority of the kids got 10 points except for a couple. When I click on the assignments, I can give those few oddball grades. So every, or everybody got, so most people got fives except for this person and this person. Everybody else got a five. So I'm going to say fill. You notice those few that I changed um, don't override. Did you see Melissa's response in the chat? She said she tried to group classes together, but it says all classes must have the same grading period. And that's yeah. what I was afraid of. Yes, so, and that's okay. I just, you know, but you should still, totally as long fine. as you're, as long as you're using the same assignment types for yes. both of them, you'll be yes. able to share yes. them as you create the assignment. Yes, yes. Thank you. But thanks for checking. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Melissa. Okay. Well, if you don't have any more questions, um, you are free to leave. Thank you for joining us, and have a great beginning of the school year.